folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. This is actually part three of our study on the giants. And I want to get right into the scripture because we have a lot of ground to cover today. Um, we, we look to the past to see what was. Now we're going to use the Bible to look into the future. And remember, if you don't believe what the Bible says for what happened yesterday or what happened 2,000 years ago, what happened 5,000 years ago, then you will probably have a problem believing the Bible for what's going to happen tomorrow because, according to us, it hasn't happened yet. And yet, I believe that God sees all of human history all at once. There is nothing that is not manifested to Him, including what is going to happen in this world, let's say, uh, five minutes from now, five years from now, 50 years from now, or whatever. God knows it all, and He expresses to us in this Bible that we can actually use the pages of the scriptures looking into what happened in the past to see into the future. The Bible uses this term. I like this term in the Bible. Uh, the phrase, to be able to see afar off. Peter talked about that when we study the scriptures and we believe that they came from God. We believe that they are the true and accurate record from God. Then God gives us the ability with the scriptures to see afar off, to see things that are going to happen. So let's go back now to the beginning. Let's look at this key area in the scriptures that deals with giants and that, that lays the groundwork and the foundation, in fact, probably would be, if you wanted to use the word uh, cornerstone, of this idea of what happens when angels, angelic beings, and still, there's some questions in some people's minds, some questions that people have asked me. Uh, some I've been able to answer, some I haven't been, but what I wasn't able to answer, let's say, two weeks ago, because of studying, because of the leadership of Holy Spirit, I have an answer now to a question that even I myself have had for a while. We're going to get into that in a minute. So we're going to look at the record of the scriptures to see what the book of Genesis says. And then we'll see what kind of, what, what is going to happen in the future. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, remember from our study last week, and if you didn't get a chance to see that, I would encourage you to stop right here, go back and watch the previous two videos, because I actually laid a biblical uh, verse by verse uh, from the King James Bible uh, foundation for who these sons of God actually are, rather than taking philosopher so-and-so or doctor who and who, uh, we're actually looking to the Bible for the answers. The Bible teaches us that sons of God is a term that belongs to the angelic realm. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I, again, I want to stop right here. And I want you to, I want you to start thinking of uh, something that we're going to look at in this video, the idea of opposites. Let me, um, let me do this, okay? Here is, here is uh, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. And here is the uh, King James Bible. This, this is my best friend in the whole world here. Um, I kind of get, get stirred when people want to call my best friend a liar. Okay, it kind of bothers me. Uh, this is Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. We're actually going to talk today about the concept of Freemasonry is actually based upon the doctrine of the giants. You're going to want to see this, okay? But let's look at opposites here for a minute because we see opposites all through the Bible. We have, you know, light and, light and darkness. We have God. We have the devil. We have, um, we have a, a, a pure woman, like, like the Virgin Mary. She was a virgin woman. And then in the Bible, you have like nasty harlot women running all through the Bible. They're, they're exact opposites of each other. So here we, have, here we have a book written by a Freemason, Albert Pike. Um, and it says right here at the, at the very front, esoteric book, which means you're not allowed to read it. I'm not even supposed to have one, but I found it in an old bookstore. Okay, esoteric book, which means... About 800 some odd pages in here, and Albert Pike is basically saying, we have a lot of secrets we're not telling anybody. And we didn't write them down in this book either, so don't think you can get a, a, a special edition of this book and find out what their secret is, because it's not in there. They didn't write it down. They're not telling anybody what it is, okay? And yet over here is a book 
where God took every secret that could ever be covered up and he explains it verse by verse right here in the Bible. In fact, he tells us as his disciples that what we receive from the Holy Spirit, we're to go tell everybody. We're not to keep anything secret. In Freemasonry, they tell you, you go through the little ritual and they say, no, you can't tell anybody. We'll slit your throat from ear to ear and all this stuff. Okay? So these are opposites here. And I want you to, I want you to get this, this, this comprehension here. Here we have... A, uh, an angelic being, a, a deity, a God. The Bible refers to the angelic realm as God's little g, okay, in the Old Testament. Especially the fallen ones, the, the devils, they are the gods that everybody worshipped all throughout antiquity and even today. Buddha was a little g God, and I think Buddha was based upon a devil, a, a fallen angel, or an evil angel, the way the Bible describes them. So I want you to get this idea. We have a, we have a, a deity, a God, that, uh, that chooses a wife out of humanity, and they create a child. I want you to, I want you to get that concept. We go to the, the gospel story of Luke, and we have something that, we have a pure version of that. We have God who is the Father, through, by way of the Holy Ghost, uh, conceives inside of Mary the, the birth body or the human body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ now is fully God and he is fully man. That's what, that's what the Bible expresses to us and we'll actually go to a place in the scriptures that will shed light on that. So I want you to think of everything that is good as far as God, heaven, if there's a heaven, there's its exact opposite, hell. Heaven is a place of eternal rest and peace and harmony and everybody singing kumbaya. And hell is a place of torment, weeping, gnashing of teeth. The worm dieth not and the fire is not quit. So you understand opposites. We have God and the devil, heaven and hell. We have Christ. We have anti-Christ. And so let's look at the Bible and how the Bible lays everything out for a clue to our understanding of who the Antichrist is, where he comes from, what is his nature. We're going to follow the scripture. So I, I want you to look at this again in verse 2. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Even in the occult circles, they have some sort of ritual that, that has to do with the male coming into the female in, in Wicca. It's called the Great Rite Ritual. In some Wiccan circles, they will take a cup, which represents the woman, okay? And they will take like a dagger, which represents the man, okay? And they'll put the dagger in the cup, and that's the Great Rite Ritual. In some Wiccan circles, however, they won't bother to use a cup and a dagger, okay? They will perform a ritual, and they'll call it Hyros Gamos. Um, Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code uh, used that term, the sacred feminine. It's the union of the male and the female, the divine with the human. That They sort of clash together. That is the exact opposite of, let's say, Christ, the bridegroom, the husband, and his church, the bride. We understand and believe that marriage, uh, going all the way back to the book of Genesis again with Adam and Eve, Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, this is a great mystery. Don't tell anybody. No, he didn't say that. He said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so that happens, or that is, a, that is an absolute in Christianity that Christ is the husband, and his church is the bride. And so we see a mockery of that right here. We see the antithesis of that. The sons of God and the daughters of men, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And if we look in verse 4, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now I want to I kind of teach this again. I think I've taught it in the previous two, but I've had many questions. People didn't, didn't understand what I said. Verse 4 tells us that in the days prior to the flood, the sons of God, these, these bad angels that left their first estate, they came into the daughters of men and they produced children, which were giants. That's how they were produced before the flood. Flood comes along, whoosh, washes them all away. Okay? What happened? How did the giants get here after the flood? Well, it says in verse 4, and also after that, 
when the sons of God came in into the daughters of men. So it's telling you that before the flood they did it, after the flood they did it again. And that's where Og and uh, Anak and Goliath, and that's where all these giants come from. All right, so here's what we're, let me tell you what we're really looking at here, okay? We're looking at, since we have the, the divinities, we have the gods, little g, um, soup of the supernatural realm, the way some people like to refer to it, or the fourth dimension, or the spirit realm, or whatever. Okay, we have we have those gods, and they have come into the just mortal men, mortal women. They have joined with them. They've married them. Now they've produced something that, in the scientific world, would be called a hybrid. Okay. Um, I have seen, see, I've been to Africa, I've seen zebras. They look like horses, but they're not really horses. There's actually a hybrid between a horse and a zebra. I don't know exactly what it's called, but there's the hybrid form of that where they took a horse and a zebra and they put them together somehow, some way, and they have this like horse zebra. Missouri is known for uh, the mule, our, our sort of state animal is a mule, Missouri, old Missouri mule, they call it, okay? A mule is the hybrid, a crossbreed between a horse and a donkey. That's what a mule is, okay? So I want you to understand this concept. Here we have people from one species. God created the angels, okay? They are life, they are a species, God created them. We have a group from one species that decided to mate with a group of another species. The resulting birth, the resulting offspring, was a hybrid. Now I want you to understand that. It was a hybrid species. It was the mingling, and we'll use this term, and I'm going to use this term because the Bible uses this term, and you're going to see where we're going here in a minute. It is the mingling of spirit seed and human seed. So where are you getting that? get it from the Bible, not from the book of Enoch, not from the, uh, the Sumerian accounts, not from Dr. So-and-so. I'm going to get it from the scriptures. I'm going to show you this. Let's examine the scriptures. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's good. I love 1 Corinthians 15. It has so much. It's a rich stew of many, many different doctrines boiled down into one particular chapter. I absolutely love this chapter. It's one of my favorite in the Bible. But we're actually going to see, and, and as, as we tried to lay out last week, we tried to lay out the concept that there are, there are human bodies, and I have a body right here. Spirits also have bodies. And that's what the Bible says. Spirits have bodies. Those bodies are based on something. Just as, just as my body is based upon the DNA that has, that has made me into what I am. Remember, in thy book, all, thy, all my members were written. David said in Psalm 139. We're going to see that. So DNA is just like a book. It's, a, it's the word that God spoke that created life. And so my body is based upon... DNA, the book that God wrote. Spirit bodies also are based upon that same idea. The Bible calls it seed. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And so here's the big question, and, and I want you to understand the use of the word body. The question is how, is, how does the resurrection happen? I mean, I don't understand. I've never seen that take place. And what body does a resurrected body have? That's the question that he's answering. So he says in verse 36, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Now I want to stop again right here. That that thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. He's referring to a seed. You take a, a kernel, a seed, a corn. And you put it into the ground, you cover it up, put some water on it. What happens to the outer shell of that, of that seed? It rots off, it corrupts, it dies. That's the way, that's what we do with humans, okay? We don't bury them, we plant them. We plant them in hope of resurrection. I have planted my father, I've planted my granddaughter in hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that what I sowed in tears... I will reap in joy. And I'm looking forward to that day. And so anyway, and so thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Look at verse 37. And that which thou sowest, 
Thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. So we take a seed, and we all know what a seed looks like, whether it's corn, wheat, or cauliflower, or whatever it is. Banana, bananas have little bitty seeds, okay? And we put that in the ground, but what comes up from the ground is not, doesn't look like what we put into it, does it? Okay? It looks like something different, but the the coding, the DNA for what that vine or what that plant looks like was in that seed. I have in me right now a, a new man. I have, a, a, I have Jesus Christ in me. When they put my body in the ground, okay, I will be resurrected again by the power of Christ into a new body. But that seed is in me right now awaiting for this body to turn to corruption so it can resurrect all over again. I hope you understand this because this is one of the neatest teachings in all of Christianity and it's that of the resurrection or let's say the rapture of the translation. Now I want you to look at verse 38. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 38. Notice what God says. But God giveth it a body and he's referring to the resurrected body, the spirit body. He's going to use that term. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and I want you to notice this, to every seed his own body. To every seed, seed equals DNA, to every seed his own body. So if there's a body, whether it's a flesh body or an angelic body, it has seed, it has DNA. And so in some people's minds, they can't fathom angels and humans. Then how does that work? Well, the Bible's actually kind of given us a clue on how it is because he's telling you that angels have a body. Spirits have a body. We'll show you. And that body is based upon a seed. It's based upon DNA. God spoke the angels into existence just like he did you and I. That's how he created everything. Now look at verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are, let's see, look at what he says. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Notice the language. This is not me coming up with this stuff. This is the word of God saying that there are celestial, which means heavenly realm, bodies. They have bodies. Okay? And bodies... Terrestrial, well, that's, Tehran means earth, that's you and I, okay? And he says, the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. And I want you to look at verse 42 now. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised, and look at the exact language of the King James Bible. It is raised a spiritual body, and then he says there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Now, I want you to get this concept, okay? Because the two, in God's eyes, are opposite. My spiritual body, which awaits my death, is far different than my mortal body, my, my corrupt body, my natural body, okay? If I'm to be resurrected, and I believe I will, it will be totally without this physical body, this skin, and this rotten mass of... Mike Hoggard that I am, this very corrupt thing that I am. I'm like Paul. In me, there is no good thing inside of me. We are, we are corruption machines is what we are. Okay? So if, I'm, if I ever want to be re resurrected, or let's say that I want to live forever, I want to be an immortal and live forever, I don't want it in this body. This body is not designed to live forever. My, my immortal body cannot have anything to do with this mortal body. So I want you to see this, okay? Here you have mortal men that die. That's their estate. We saw that last week. The estate of man is to die. Angels, they don't die, okay? So what happened? In Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, they mixed that which was immortal into that which was mortal. 
And it actually corrupted both of them. It, it just made a very, very nasty thing out of it. And you're going to see that as we move on. Now look in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. What was he made out of? God spoke him and he was made out of dirt. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The, the, he is alive. He's a, he's a new man. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is Lord from heaven. And I want you to see how even how the Bible's laid out. I have... I have the first man here in the Old Testament, that's of the earth, it's carnal. I have the new man here, which is from heaven, which is spiritual. So the Bible is, is trying to draw our attention to all this, but it's telling us that celestial things have a body, terrestrial things have a body, and seed is what designs them both. Now in verse 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And so I want you to, I just wanted to lay that out for you and understand when the Bible talks about bodies, okay, it's referring to, it could be referring to both the natural realm, earthly body, or a celestial body, which has its own form, it has its own fashion, it's as real as you and I are, and it was designed by seed. It has seed. It has DNA to it. And we're going to see from the scriptures that God specifically warned us about mingling these things together. I mentioned earlier about this concept of, um, of, of thinking of the opposites. Thinking of the sons of God and the daughters of men and how they bear children. And think of, uh, think of how Jesus came to the earth. We have it in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So I want you to, I want you to kind of use this as a framework of understanding what happened in Genesis chapter 6 with the angels, or the, the sons of God, uh, the angels who left their first estate, and the daughters of men. They bear children to them. Likewise, Mary also. Now, I don't believe, as Mormon doctrine teaches, we talked about that earlier. Here's uh, the doctrine, the pearl of great price. Uh, Mormon doctrine teaches that God came down to the earth, knocked on Mary's door, winked at her. Hey, baby. Okay? And you get the rest of the picture. That didn't happen. Okay? The Holy Ghost, which is what? The Spirit of God. But what did Jesus say about the Spirit? He said, my words are Spirit, and they are life. And so I want you to understand the concept that seed, and we'll, we'll see this from the Bible, seed is actually DNA, which is the Word of God. And that was the conception of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. It says specifically the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God gave conception inside of Mary and birthed Jesus. So here is Christ and how did he get here? He was the, he was the offspring of a human woman and the Most High God. The Antichrist. Who's he going to be? I believe the scriptures are telling us that the Antichrist is the offspring of, not of God, but someone who wants to be like the most high God and a human woman. Okay? So, this thing that happened in, in Genesis chapter 6, a mockery of the plan of God. If you, if you studied any of the occult, if you studied, uh, there's several books, mainly Hall's Secret Teaching of All Agents. Uh, uh, there are other books that talk about uh, Mystery Babylon. Okay, The two Babylons, Alexander Hislop. Uh, he talks about how the Roman Catholic Church basically is a cheap knockoff of the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. And he says basically you go all the way back to ancient Babylon and you'll find the concept of a woman being seated by a god and producing this child. Okay, So all these statues all over the world of this sacred woman with the sun disk behind her head holding a baby, that's supposed to be Mary and Jesus, right? Wrong! Okay, Number one, because God doesn't like idols. So we know it's not him. 
Who is it? It's the offspring of a God and a human woman to produce this, this hybrid child who's supposed to be like the savior of mankind, but I'm not buying it. I want us to go back now and understand this idea of what I've been saying the word seed equals DNA. We actually have a video called Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible. And if you don't have a copy of that, you can see it on our website or you can call us and we'll get you a copy of it so you can watch and understand. But I'm going to go back and revisit this for the sake of our understanding in this video to explain to you that when the Bible says seed, it means DNA. Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Stop Stop right here. The phrase his kind is where we get the word kindred. Okay, the where the word kindergarten comes from. It's our children, our offspring. Uh, my, my son is the offspring of me. He is after my kind. I have passed on my seed, my DNA, down to my son who plays a lot of musical instruments like me and he kind of looks like me and he's a big boy like me. So I know it's my son. He has my seed, my DNA. He was produced after his kind. And then it says, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after this kind. And God saw that it was good. I want you to look in Genesis chapter 7. Uh, the Bible says in verse 3, uh, and he's referring to the ark of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Seed. God used the ark to preserve the DNA of all the, all the animals, all the birds, all the bees, all the humans. God used the ark to keep seed alive. He had to keep the DNA alive on the earth so that after they came off the ark, they reproduced and filled the earth once again. Look in Genesis chapter 38. Now, I don't like to normally talk about this, but I think it's important in our discussion okay, that men carry seed. In Genesis chapter 38, verse 8, And Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up what? Seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And so, and I'm not going to use any more terms than this, but you understand the concept is seed equals DNA. Here's what we know that maybe they didn't quite catch back in the old days. Here's what we know now, is that the man contributes chromosomes or DNA, the woman contributes chromosomes or DNA, and those two lock together inside the, inside the egg of the woman, and that child now has been conceived. That is a human being, by the way, because God wrote the book on it. I still don't think it's right to go in and kill it. Okay. Anyway, but you get the concept that seed equals DNA. And I want you to follow this as we move along. Now, um, in uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 2, here's another phrase when it talks about seed. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech. Stop right here. Give any of his seed unto Unto Molech is what it says. Remember from our, our first video on this, Molech, the Hebrew word Malach, which means angel, uh, the Amalekites and so on, that whole con Molech was a god. And God said, don't give your seed unto Molech. Okay? And he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off. And, and all that go a whoring, notice the terminology here, after him, to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. You see, look at the terminologies here. Committing whoredoms with a god. I mean, think about that. Think about what God strictly forbid in the Old Testament when it came to lying down with beasts. And beasts also describe not only earthly realm, terrestrial beast, but also celestial beast as well. You remember the phrase zodiac? You know what it means? It means a circle of beasts. 
And that was the stars. It's referring to the angelic, the evil angels that are surrounding the earth right now. So Moloch, God specifically said, don't go a whoring after Moloch to give Moloch your seed. He said, don't do it. Now, uh, the Bible, back when the Bible was written, okay, 1611, they did not have the term deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay? It hadn't been invented yet. But DNA has always been around. It was referred to as seed. It was referred to as different things. And we find out from the scriptures that DNA or the seed is just like the book that God wrote, the Word of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 14, the sower soweth the Word. So a seed is a representation of DNA. It's a representation of the Bible, the Word of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By the way, if your DNA is messed up, you won't live. Okay, So the phrase, the Word of God, the seed, and DNA, they all are... Uh, they all reference the same thing. Now we get into Psalm 139, verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And so the idea that God is saying to us that a book that God wrote, His Word, is actually the seed or the DNA that formed us. In thy book all my members, my fingers, arms, hands, hair, were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. My body is based upon seed. It's based upon DNA. It's based upon a book. Celestial bodies, whether they are of the angelic order that is now, or they are, of, they are awaiting, um, as it were, when I am resurrected, I will become, uh, I will become an angel. I will become a... a a son of God. So that term, sons of God, that would be literal, wouldn't it? Because if angels were created, and they were created with seed, which is DNA, which is a book, who wrote the book of angels? Who gave them that? God, their father, did. And so the term, sons of God, is accurate, and it's pointing to those who are of the angelic realm, whether they are that way now, or they will become that way after we are resurrected. You see where I'm going with this, okay? So the sons, they have bodies, they have seed, just like you and I have seed. God gave me my DNA, I transferred that down to my son. The same thing, likewise, is, is that story is told us in the pages of the Bible. Now... Uh, something I want you to get a hold of. In fact, in fact, I showed you this a while ago. Genesis chapter 5. The Bible says this is the book of the generations of Adam. I want you to notice, okay, in Genesis chapter 5. We have in the Old Testament, okay, this is the first Adam. It's earthy, okay? We have, it's called the book, DNA, of the generations. I want you to look at the word generation. It has the word gene in it. Think about it. Okay, your genes are passed down to your generations. People look at my kids and say, yeah, that's that dad coming out of them, or that's their mom coming out of them. Why? Because I've given my genes, my generations, to my children. So the Old Testament is the book of the generation. That's the first time the word book is used in the Bible, by the way. The book of the generations of Adam. Okay, you know the first time the word book is used in the New Testament? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now the New Testament is the book of the genes, the genetics, the DNA, the seed of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Revelation chapter 22, it's called the book of life. Now I want to show you something, and we've, I've dealt with this, I don't know how many times before in various videos, okay, that if DNA... The seed that is transferred from human to human, human from kind to kind. If, if, if DNA is a book and God wrote that book, there's rules that apply to this. So in Revelation 22, verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, 
If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And so, number one, seed equals DNA. Number two, DNA is written just like a book. Number three, God wrote that book. Number four, God has rules. And rule number one is, do not take anything out of the book. Rule number two, do not add anything to the book. You're not to take words out. You're not to add words into it. Let's, let's think about this, okay? Let's think about the idea that genetic scientists now who are able to read DNA just like a book. Isn't that amazing that they figure that out? Okay, They're looking at DNA and they're going, oh, look here, it says right here that this gene causes cancer. So if they take this part of DNA out, which God said don't do that, if they take this part of DNA out, well, we've got to replace it with something. Let's go get something else and put it in here. Okay? Now, now humans won't get cancer anymore. That's what they're doing. And I'm going to show you. We've, we've dealt with several news articles, and I'm not going to run through them all. But one thing after another, where scientists are taking out parts of human DNA, and they're taking animal DNA and putting it in its place. Or they're taking Mon Monsanto. Monsanto. Okay? Monsanto is taking um, corn, wheat, they're taking parts of that DNA out and they're putting human DNA in its place, in seeds, and burying them in the ground. Okay? I just, I just have, a, I have a huge problem with that. So does God, by the way. And he won't talk. And they're doing that. Watch this now. They're doing that. They're mixing different kinds together. No, it's not done through, you know, copulation. It's being done in a test tube, but it's being done, mixing different kinds. And God said, absolutely no, you're not supposed to do that. I want us to look at Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to understand what the Bible says here. The Lord, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and look at the words, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. And I want you to understand now that we're dealing with a conspiracy here. And everybody says, ah, cons I knew you were a conspiracy. I am. I believe in a great big gigantic conspiracy that's spelled out for us in the Bible. Okay, Because the devil trying to get, uh, he's trying to get the throne of God, Isaiah chapter 14. Okay? He's trying to conquer everything that he can conquer. And so he, he causes Adam and Eve to fall. He causes them to be in sin, and God places a curse upon them. And it says here, it uses the phrase seed, between thy seed. God, God is the one who said that the devil has seed. He says it in Genesis 3. He says it in 1 Corinthians, if it's a celestial body, it has seed. That seed can be passed along. So God is, God is the one who's telling us this. And he's saying that the seed of the woman, this puny little human, puny human, right? Puny little human is going to conquer this great big mighty angel. And the devil's going, no way. Okay? I think the devil's jealous. I really do. I think when God made man a little lower than the angels, but he's going to exalt man over the angels, I think the devil's going, oh no, uh -uh, not on my watch. It's not going to happen. And right here, God himself is saying that the seed of the woman, the DNA, is going to conquer. It's going to bruise the head of the seed, the offspring, the kind of the serpent. And I'm just believing what the Bible says, okay? So now watch this, okay? The devil says, oh, really? You mean the DNA of these humans is going to conquer me? Hmm. I'm going to, um, I'm going to change man's DNA. 
If I can alter the seed of the woman, then it won't happen. He can actually make the prophecy not happen. So I want you to look in Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now I want you to think about what the Bible's saying here. Okay, because God said that the seed of the woman was going to conquer the seed of the serpent. And the devil's going, let's see here. If I can mess up the seed of the woman, then that won't happen. It won't actually take place. It's almost like he's wanting to go back and reverse time or something like that so that something doesn't happen. He's desperately trying to make sure that what God said doesn't happen. Remember, that's how he works. He could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and here God said, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The devil comes along and says, thou shalt not surely die. His goal, his method of operation, his mindset is to do everything that he can to make sure that the word of God does not happen. I mean, after all, it's the word of God, Jesus Christ, that conquered the power of the devil, who has the power over death, at the cross. Don't you think the devil would just love to go back in a time machine and revisit that one again? Because after all, the devil is the one that went right into Judas Iscariot to cause him to betray Jesus so that Jesus was delivered to Herod and then to Pilate and then to the cross. And the devil said, got him. I got him. I win. I win. Okay? <laughs> And then he realizes, uh-oh, that was the wrong plan. And I think he would like to do anything to go back and change all of that. So he wants to alter the prophecy so that it never occurred. This is why he's changing all the Bibles, by the way, to alter the prophecy. So look at it. So this, he's, God said the seed of the woman is going to conquer the seed of the serpent. We, we come down about a thousand years later after Adam and Eve okay, to the days of Noah and we find now that the sons of God and the daughters of men, and they married all of these uh, uh, the human women, and they produce these giants. Now you have these hybrids running around everywhere, okay? Who are not all human and not all deity either. They're like the, the mixed offspring. They're not one and they're not the other. They have corrupted the DNA. But Noah was perfect, according to this verse, in his generations. And I want you to notice in verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And so I, I'm looking at a situation here where it looks like to me that the seed of the woman was in danger of becoming totally corrupt, and yet God, what did God say he wanted to do with the ark? He was going to preserve seed, preserve that DNA. And we know, we know from the Bible, that when that promise came from God to Eve, that Eve passed her genes down to her children, all the way down to Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They in turn passed it down through the line of, of, of Eber, which went down to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, which went down to David, which followed all the way down to Jesus Christ. God preserved the seed. He preserved his word in the form of Jesus Christ. And it worked. Okay? It worked brilliantly. And so, but if you look, that all flesh prior to the flood had corrupted his way. And, and let's let's not make this far fetched because look at the world we're living in right now. How many farmers do you think in the world are actually putting seeds out in their farm that are non-hybridized seeds? Very, very few. We have genetically modified food in every can, every supermarket, every corner grocery store. It is everywhere. And now man is on the precipice, right over the edge of being able to alter his own genetic structure. Oh, we're going to live forever this way. No, not really. It's not going to happen. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I want you to follow me on this. We're talking about hybrids. I want you to look at what the Bible says. The Bible has laws against this. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender. See the word gender there? 
That is gene. has the word gene in it. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with, look at it, mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. You need to stop and think about that. Your garment of, of, of linen and woolen? What's up with that? Linen comes from plants. Wool comes from animals. God, God wanted to set a theme here. I don't want anything of diverse kinds mingling together. What is it that the children of Israel saw in the land of Canaan? They saw the offspring of Anak. They saw the offspring of the giants everywhere in the land of Canaan. In Ezra chapter 9, okay? We're gonna, you're going to see something here. And God specifically told the Israelites, when you go in there, don't marry those people. Why? Okay, we're going to find out. Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Remember the Amorites? Okay, they were giants. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, look at this, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. This was a direct violation of what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 7. God said, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Think about it. Stop right here. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Why? Why were they greater and mightier? Because they were offsprings of the giants. Okay? They were of the giant seed. They were of the hybrid race. And they were stronger and mightier. mightier. Okay? And notice what God said. He said in verse 2, When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter sh thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. God said, when you go in there, kill them all. Don't marry them. Don't save, any, don't save some back and say, Hey son, what do you think about her? Okay? God said, don't do that. Don't mingle the holy seed, Israel. Do not mingle your DNA with them. God was very specific about this. He warned them about it. Please, please don't do this. Now I want you to get this, okay? So we have a situation before the flood where sons of God, daughters of men, they produce these giants, okay? Did these giants produce offspring themselves after they were here on the earth? Well, after the flood... We have Og, king of Bashan. We have Anak, who, is, who has an entire race of people named after him. He, Anak was a giant. Anak, um, Arba was his father. You remember that? Arba was a giant as well. And Arba was the father of Anak. Arba was himself a giant from who? More than likely, uh, just another woman on the earth. So once you have the sons of God and the daughters of men coming in together and creating these giants, these giants, as they grew, they're taking women to themselves. And what are they doing? They're passing their gender, their kind, their seed their DNA. And, and I want you to see what happens over time. If you remember, if you look in um, Deuteronomy chapter 3, you remember that Og, his bed was nine cubits. Nine cubits tall, 13 and a half feet. First Samuel chapter 17, we see that Goliath was six cubits. We have a reduction in size from nine to six cubits. That's, that's quite a Quite a reduction here, and yet six cubits, that's still over nine and a half feet tall, almost ten feet tall. That's pretty big. Okay, that's pretty huge, but still not as tall as a knock. What happened? Well, what happens anytime there is a hybrid, and then you take that hybrid and you breed it with other things? What happens is, is that the genetic traits of that original hybrid, they diminish throughout successive generations. Anybody who is into animal husbandry or dealing with plants, hybrid plants, anything, they know about this. Okay, I just remember a little bit from biology class. But as time goes on, 
that DNA is still there. It's latent, but it's still there, but it's diminishing over time. And the Israelites go in unto a people in the land of Canaan that according to what we see in the scripture, they have been completely inundated with the corrupted seed or the corrupted DNA of the giants. And God specifically said, don't go in there and marry those people to your children. Do not mix. In Ezra, that was their, that was their sin that God specifically said they have mingled the holy seed with the people of those lands. Do you know what happened in the days of Ezra? God was so, listen, I want to tell you that God was so uh, sincere about this thing, and the people of Israel were as well. Do you know what they did? They took everybody that had ever married a, a Canaanite or a Perizzite or whatever, and they had them put away their wives and their children, and they said, no, you cannot be part of our family anymore. That's, man. But God was serious because the, the seed of the giants, the hybrid seed of the giants, God knew that it was still inside of some of the people in the land of Canaan. It was still there. And God knew that if the devil was successful then he could successfully introduce the corrupt seed of these giants into the bloodline that would be Jesus and the prophecy wouldn't work anymore. You see the plan? Okay, so here's, here's where we're going with this. Okay, um, We're looking at things that are mingled together in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 50, this is uh, Jeremiah 50 and 51, our prophecy concerning Babylon. Notice what the Bible says. The sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the, look at here, the mingled people that are in the midst of her, and they shall become as women, a sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. God was showing us that the land of Babylon, or the kingdom of Babylon, is full of the mingled people. And this is why God says over and over and over, come out from among them and do what? Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. God said, stay away from them. Okay, now, does that, does that DNA still exist today? I say it's possible. Okay, I don't know where it is. I say it's possible. Okay, and other people do too, but that other people doesn't matter. It's what the Word of God says. But God specifically did not want the Israelites mingling their bloodline, which was going to be the bloodline of the covenant that was going to produce Jesus Christ. God did not want His Word, His seed, mingled with the seed of the devil, the seed of the serpent. Because the prophecy would then be nullified. We talked about, we use this illustration of opposites here. Okay, And I'm going to show you that. Let, let's read this verse again, Leviticus 19.19. 19. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. And thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. And then you have the linen and the woolen. Okay, God, God is showing you opposites here. Diverse means they're, they're opposite. Okay? Linen and woolen. Linen comes from plants. Wool comes from animals. And God said, don't, don't mix them together. I want you to understand this principle that he keeps things that are opposite, separated. My people and Babylon come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, because they're opposites. God wants his bride to be a virgin, wants her to be pure. Babylon, <laughs> she hadn't been pure forever. Okay, And God says, I want my people separate from them. I want us to go back and look at Genesis chapter 6 for understanding of this. This is actually going to lay a principle for, here is uh, morals and dogma. And on the front here, and I've used this illustration before, we have a double-headed eagle. One of them's looking this way, one of them's looking that way. It's opposites. And yet they're fused together in the same body here. What's up with that? Okay, Let's go back and look at Genesis chapter 6. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Now stop right here. Okay, Sons, that's masculine. Daughters, feminine. Okay, They're opposites. Boys are not girls. Girls are not boys. Okay, sons of God, the celestial bodies of angels, daughters of men, the terrestrial bodies of humans. 
sons of God, celestial seed, daughters of men, terrestrial seed. God said, don't mingle them together. Don't do it. Okay? But when they came on, on, onto them, children were born unto them. So we have the hybridization of opposites. The two opposites came together and formed one flesh or one body. And God, all through the scriptures, says they're to stay apart. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided. Look what he did. God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. You understand this, don't you? Light, and uh, we always use this expression when we talk about, let's say, uh, two twins, two brothers. We have two brothers here, okay? The older they get, the more, the more separate I can see them. I can see that one is more modeled after his mother, and one is more modeled after his father. And in some cases, we look at people and say, they are as different as night from day. Well, that means something to us because day and night are opposites one of another. And yet, with every opposite, there is always a point at which they seem to fuse together. What would be the fusion point of day and night? Morning. Or, as the books spell out, twilight okay the fusion point of more of uh, day and night where they sort of mingle together is called morning did you know morning had a baby morning had a little boy okay isaiah 14 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O lucifer there it is son of the morning I just believe the Bible, okay? Did you know it says, and I don't have this verse here, you can find it for yourself. Did you know the Bible, the King James Bible specifically says the, the morning has a womb. It's referred to as the womb of the morning. You go look it up, you'll see it, okay? The Bible calls him Lucifer, number one. We've dealt with that. Number two, it's literal interpretation as he is the son of the morning. He is the fusion of night and day. We're actually going to see a picture of him drawn exactly that way here in just a little bit. I want you to notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you're all children of the light and children of the day. I mean, look at the terminology. Children, which are offspring. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And I want you to notice that God said, my children are children of, of a light only. Not of darkness. There's no darkness. In God is light and in him is no darkness, the Bible says. So we are children of God and hence we are children of light, not hybrids. Here he says there are children of the darkness. Okay, um, um, Aleister Crowley and Blavatsky, they had, a, they had an occult group called the Order of the Golden what? Dawn. Morning. Morning, the fusion point between light and darkness. It was mingling the two together. But he says, children of the day and children of the night, and they're not the same. They're to be separate. One is one and the other is the other. Notice he uses terms like drunken and sober. The children of the night are drunken. The children of the day are sober. That includes physical and spiritual drunkenness. Those who run around and say, oh, we're drunk in the Spirit of God. Woo! No, you're not. No, you're not, okay? You're a child of darkness then if you're drunk. Notice the opposites. Children of the day are sober. Children of the night are drunk. They're opposites. God doesn't mix the two. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Notice the opposites in here. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord." 
and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so right here, God is, I mean, he's, Paul is laying it out specifically. Christ, Belial, and there was, they never came together. Okay, Light and darkness. There's no fusion there. There's no agreement between light and darkness. Uh, believers and unbelievers. Okay, um, Incorruptible. Corruptible. Okay? I don't share my pulpit with someone who's going to preach out of the NIV. Not going to happen. I'm not going to bring darkness in the midst of light. I won't do it. Okay? So you understand this concept that the opposites are to be separate, and yet everything we find in the occult world says, oh, no, no, no. They're fused together. They're going to make the... Think of the tree of knowledge of what? Good and evil in one fruit together. The fusion of opposites. That's why God said, eat of this tree. You eat of this tree, you'll die. That's why he said it. Now, um, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. God is, is telling us. The reason why we've spent so much time in these last two videos discussing the idea of giants and, and, and the mingling of the sons of God and the daughters of men, the reason why we've been doing that is because God is telling us, look to the past, so you can see so you can see the future what else did he say Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 but as the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be stop right here okay it specifically mentions in Genesis chapter 6 the sons of God daughters of men and there were giants there were hybrids in those days God specifically mentioned that as being part of what happened in the days of Noah. And I want you to notice, if you go back to Genesis 6, the sons of God took the daughters of men and took them wives. Specifically uses the word wives there, right? Go back to Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so God is telling us is that when we look to the past, we're getting a glimpse then of the future. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. The historical record of the scriptures telling us what happened in the past is also indicating to us what happens in the future. God says he uses, in Hosea chapter 12 verse 10, he uses what's called similitudes. He said, I've also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and I have used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. A similitude is a type. It's an example. If I were to say, uh, if I was an umpire, and I wanted to show that the batter swung the ball and swung at the ball and missed, I make a sign. I go, Poof! okay? Some of them do it better than others, okay? That's a strike call. You know what I've just done? I've used a similitude. I've used a symbol, a sign, to indicate that that batter committed an error. He has a strike against him. That's what similitude is. All through the Bible, you have characters all throughout the scriptures that are similitudes, men. A man in the Bible is either a picture of Christ or the Antichrist. Think about it, okay? Goliath, who was he? Goliath was a hybrid and he was a picture of the Antichrist, wasn't he? David wasn't, and he was a picture of Christ. We have women in the Bible. They're a picture of a, of a church, either a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, uh, a virtuous church, or a harlot church, one way or the other. So God is using similitudes in the Bible to show us how things are going to be in the last days. He also says that he, uh, that he spoke by the prophets. One of those was Daniel. We'll get into Daniel here in a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, the Apostle Paul is telling us that all of these things happen in the Bible as examples or in samples, a sample to us, a sampling of what is going to come in the ends of the world. And so if we want to understand the future, we must look and understand that the Bible is a perfect, 
accurate record of everything that happened. Now let's go to the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prophet and God used him to speak. God gave a dream to Nebuchadnezzar. You remember that dream. He saw the image, the, the head of gold and the, and the, the body of, uh, of silver and the legs of, of brass and the, and the uh, feet of iron and clay. What does all of that mean? Well, let's look at it from the scripture. I want you to notice this. Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. The fourth kingdom... Now let me stop right here. Remember the number four always indicates the spiritual realm. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. We'll see that in a minute. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed, with miry clay. Stop right here. Iron is the exact opposite of clay. Iron is strong. Clay is weak. Iron is what breaks clay in pieces. Clay never breaks iron in pieces. Iron and clay are opposites, and yet they are fused together in the ten-toed kingdom that's going to come on the earth in the last days. The last days kingdom is a kingdom of fusion. It's a kingdom of opposites. Okay? Notice how the Bible describes clay. Job chapter 4, verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less them that dwell in houses of clay. Remember, God made Adam out of dirt. And so the clay represents mankind. What does the iron represent? Well, remember the beast has teeth of iron. Uh, Goliath had, a, uh, had a, uh, a, a, um, a shield of iron. Okay, There's iron associated with these guys. Did you know that at the core of every star in the universe, the cores of those stars are iron? That's how come bodies like planets revolve around them. You know why? Because they're magnetic. That's what iron is. Iron is highly magnetic. Okay? So you have, you have the sun in the middle of our solar system, and you have all these planetary bodies that rotate around it. You know what? That's because the center of, of our sun is just pure iron, is what it is, and it's magnetic. Likewise, the center of the earth, and both these are hot and molten, okay? The center of the earth is also made out of iron. I want you to think of something. In the days of Noah, do you remember the, where the water came from? Okay. Oh yeah, it rained for 40 days. That's not all of it. The Bible says that it came down from the skies and it came up from the deep. Think about what's going to happen in the last days. Uh, Revelation 12 says angels are going to fall, stars are going to fall from the heaven. You know what else is going to happen? The, the pit is going to be opened up and this flood of iniquity is going to rise up out of it. These devils in Revelation chapter 9 and the king of them, which is the king of the bottomless pit, which is the destroyer, they're going to rise up out of that pit. Isn't it interesting that stars and the core of the earth, they're both made out of iron. And it's that kingdom, those, that, those angels that will fall and those evil angels that will rise up in the last days, they constitute that iron kingdom of the last days. Now look at what it says. Daniel chapter 2, verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. Look at what it says. They, the iron kingdom, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Look at there, look at there. They, and we've already seen, we've already seen, according to Scripture, that they have seed. They have, they have a body. They have DNA. God gave it to them. That's how come God is their father. They are the sons of God, literally. They have seed, and man has seed, and the part of the kingdom in the last days where the iron is mixed with clay is that they are going to mingle themselves with the DNA of mankind. That's what's going to happen. That, that's, why, that's what happened in the days of Noah. That's what happened in the days of Israel. That is what's going to happen now. Um, we notice this number four. Notice in Daniel chapter 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast. And I want you to notice that he was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Some people say, oh, it's going to be the revived Roman Empire in the last days. Oh, no. Oh, no. 
it's going to be far, far, far greater and far worse than that. That fourth kingdom is not a terrestrial kingdom that rules over other people. That is a kingdom of gods ruling over people. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, look at this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But look at this. Principalities, number one. Number two, powers. Number three, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And number four, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice we have the four things mentioned here. And one of them specifically says the rulers of the darkness of this world. You know who that is? Stars. So the Bible's telling us this fourth kingdom is a mingling of those angelic realm beings, both those that fall from the sky and those that rise up from the depths, the mingling of their seed with human seed, human DNA. That's exactly what the Bible's getting at. And the Bible refers to this as the biggest of all secrets. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel 2, 22, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. In other words, this idea, and I'm going to show you this. I'm going to spend time showing you this. This idea of the angels mixing with human women, producing giants, the fact that it happened, the fact that it's going to happen again, is at the core and the heart and the center of every false religious system, every cult, every secret society that there is. They all have the same mystery religion. And what is that religion? It's the, it's the religion of the hybrids, the gods mixing with human women. Albert Pike, in, in Here in Morals and Dogma, referred to it as the Grand Arcanum, the secret whose revelation, look at how he described it, would overturn earth and heaven. You know what secret societies are, don't you? Secret societies. Uh, here's a picture of the Skull and Bones Society. You know, George Bush and John Kerry and all those guys that keep running for president, and they say, oh, we're different from that guy. No, they're not. Same secret society. Okay? Or, no, excuse me, they don't like for anybody to call them a secret society. They are a society with a secret, but they're not going to tell you what that secret is. But this secret society over here has this exact same secret society, whether it's Freemasons or Oddfellows or the Vatican or Rosicrucians. Here's the Rosicrucian description of what their religion is all about. The manner and the means by which the present day man is transformed into what? The divine Superman. This symbol, the Christian Rose Cross, shows the end and aim of human evolution. The solution of the world mystery, man's past evolution, present constitution, and particularly the secret, that there it is, the secret of his future development. Rosicrucians say it's about men becoming God. Well, that's exactly what the son of the morning said in the Garden of Eden, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the secret is how to make man into gods. They are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Let's take some time now. I mentioned, I mentioned the double-headed eagle here. If you read all 800 pages of Moral and Dogma, you'll find out that he never actually said, this is the secret. Okay? But he allegorized it thousands of times inside of this book. And you see here the image of the double-headed eagle on the front of this book. And Albert Pike says, this, this eagle looking this way represents one thing, represents the father. And this eagle looking this way represents the mother. And he said, they are joined together in one body, one flesh. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. When God created man, he, gave him a, he made him a wife, and they two came together. And Adam said, Now this is bone of my bone, it's in flesh of my flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father's mother, and shall cling to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. How does that work? Well, we all know that when the man and the woman come together, and they cleave to one another, what happens? It happens nine months later. They literally become one flesh in the form of who? their child, their offspring, okay? Who is the Antichrist, okay? Child of the devil, seed of the serpent, the offspring. That's who he is. That's 
the secret. It's the biggest secret in all the world. It's the secret that they said, we'll kill you if you tell anybody this secret. And God said, hey, I just want you to tell everybody what's going on. Let's look at the image of the square. Let's look at some Masonic symbols and other symbols around us and see this concept that it represents the fusion of the heavenly kingdom, the earthly realm fused together to produce an offspring. Here's the square and compass. This is at Hershey, Pennsylvania. I should have noticed that it's lodge number 666. Hmm, that's awfully interesting. Okay? And I want you to notice that you have a symbol of like something pointing upward, and it seems to be fused with something that's pointing downward. Here's another image of it here. We have the compass, which is used... To, by the way, you just think about it, okay? A compass is used to draw what? A circle. And a, a square is used to draw what? A square. A circle and a square are opposites, okay? But you, there's a concept called circling the square. It's as this bizarre mathematical concept. And they said, yeah, it's, it can actually be done. You can circle a square or square circle. I don't understand it. I just know that they represent opposites. And I want you to notice that those symbols are fused together. And by the way, you have a G in the middle of it. Okay? You have a G. What does that G represent? Well, some say it's geometry. Some say it's Gaia. Some say it's uh, gematria, okay? Uh, some say it represents God. Could be. I will be like the Most High. That's what Lucifer said. The letter G um, is a number. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's seven. So we have the number seven here embedded inside of the... And I want you to know that there's a beast that rises up out of the sea that happens to have um, seven heads. You know why he has seven heads? Because his father, the dragon, guess how many heads he had? Had seven heads. Okay? So you think about that. But anyway, here's what Albert Pike says. Now think about what we did. Okay? Here we have sons of God, heavenly realm, uh, beings with DNA, with bodies, with, with seed. Daughters of men. They're exact opposite, uh, earthly bound people with seed. Mingle them together. I want you to think about that. Because Albert Pike says, The square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of this earth, and the compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens. The compass is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity, male, sons of God, and the square of the productive earth or universe, daughters of men. The square in the compass is shows the sons of God and the daughters of men joining together to produce the hybrid the God-man, the Antichrist. The symbols of the two columns, Jachin and Boaz, stop right here. Solomon built a temple with two pillars in it, one called Jachin and one called Boaz. In the scriptures, it tells us that they were both 23 cubits tall, 23 plus 23. You know what that is? The daddy has 23 chromosomes. The mama has 23 chromosomes. And they put the 23 chromosomes together to make the child, the baby, okay? That's what that represents. And Freemasonry says our secret is all about Jachin and Boaz. Well, look at this imagery here of Jachin and Boaz. You have them tied together. Above Jachin is the image of the sun. Above Boaz is the image of the moon. They're opposites. You have superior. You have inferior. You have, or, or excuse me, superior and inferior. You have potter and modder, which is father and mother. And I want you to notice that they, everything about these things all points down to the center object here, which is the fusion of them both together, the hybrid. Here's another image of it. All these Masonic emblems here, and they, you notice this square in the compass, and Jacob and Boaz, the fusion of the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. I want you to notice in this graphic here, you have the two columns, Jacob and Boaz, and I want you to notice that on one, you have a globe of the earth, and on the other, you have a globe of the stars. Think about that. The stars represents the male. The earth represents the female, and they're joining together. I want you to notice also you have a stairwell. By the way, DNA looks like a stairwell. You have a stairway, and I want you to notice that it connects a higher room with a lower room. Think of the imagery of the opposites here. Here we have masons performing a ritual that they call three times three times three. I want you to notice 
that the mason's feet are all joined together at the bottom. I want you to notice also that their hands are joined together at the top. And then I want you to notice that their hands are joined together in the middle. So you have the lower realm, the higher realm, and they're all fused together. They meet in the middle. Okay? There is a song by, by Black Eyed Peas. You ought to see the video. Go Google the video. Okay? A rock group called Black Eyed Peas where you have uh, one of the singers of the group, a, a black man, and you have another singer of the group, a, a white woman, and you have the black man, he represents, he's out in space. He's like a spaceman. Okay? And you have this woman, and she's laying there like Eve. Okay? And, uh, and the song is called Meet Me Halfway. And it's about this deity, this alien, coming together with this human woman. You've seen that movie, haven't you? Just about every movie in the world that has an alien in it, there's always the alien falls in love with the chick, and they always have a baby in every single one of them. That's because of this concept right here. Here is an image of the royal arch of Freemasonry. I want you to notice this, that we have opposites. We have uh, things joining together in what's called the keystone. They're joined together by the keystone. Here is another image of the keystone. The keystone, let me stop right here. The keystone represents the fusion of the opposites coming together. That's the Antichrist. That is the last day's kingdom, the iron mixed with miry clay in the last day's kingdom. Okay. I want you to notice above that symbol, however, that there are three, and we dealt with this last week, there are three hexagrams. A hexagram simply is two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down, that are mingled together. It's actually a representation of the number six. I want you to look at this graphic again. You have three hexagrams. What do you have? Three sixes. Where is that found in the scriptures? Revelation chapter 13, look at this. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number. I want you to notice the words here. Count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a what? A man. And his number is 603 score and 6. A beast? Let's see here. Um, what can I use as opposites here? Well, anyway. A beast, the heavenly realm, angels, and human. Okay, the earthly realm. The number of the beast is actually the number of the hybrid, 603 score and 6. Let me, let me show you this in God's kingdom. Okay, I like this. The number 6. It, if you look in Genesis 6, what you see is the hybrid. Sons of God, daughters of men coming together. Okay, In the book of Revelation, 603 score and 6. The hybrids, beast and man together in the same body. Remember what we said about Jesus, that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. I want you to look at this. In 1 first, uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We're going to count. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Six things here that characterize who Jesus was and who was Jesus. He was fully God and he was fully man. He represents the joining together of God's kingdom with the kingdoms of this world. We know in the last days, I mean beyond everything else, that in the new heaven and new earth, New Jerusalem comes down from heaven and lands on the earth, and earth and heaven are finally joined together by God's wonderful plan through Jesus Christ. All of this other stuff here is the exact opposite. Whereas God's kingdom brings life and light and eternal life, this kingdom will bring everlasting destruction upon mankind. Okay, And, those, and the mark of the beast... The number of the beast, 603 score and 6, is specifically pointed in this direction. The direction of, of the day upon which man fuses something into his DNA and becomes God himself. The fusion of the iron kingdom and the clay kingdom together. Here's a Masonic graphic of what Masons call the architect. I want you to notice his arms. His arms, he has one arm pointing up and one arm pointing down, and they're fused together. And by the way, he has Jacob and Boaz's legs. I don't know if you see that or not. He has the sun as a face. 
Okay? This is a picture of the architect of masonry. One arm pointing up and one arm pointing down. That's opposites. His hands, and this is something interesting. Here's a graphic. It's called a Lewis key. You see, uh, masonry came from the guys who used to build stone cathedrals. They were masons, okay? Stone mason. And these guys knew how to do stuff, okay? They knew how to take great big humongous blocks and lift them up and put them right in place, okay, without leaving any mark or anything like that on the stone. And here's how they did it. What they did was they would take a big block, okay, and they would, they would start notching something out of the middle of it. Okay, and they put a little big notch in there. And they had three pieces of metal that they called Lewis keys. And the two outer pieces of metal, you'll see according to the diagram, are sort of like little pyramid shaped. And they were to go on the outsides of that notch. And then what locked them all together was the piece that went down into the middle. And they would lock those together and that would allow them to hoist up these huge, I mean it's an ingenious invention. I mean it's pretty cool if you look at it. But masonry tells you that the Lewis key is actually an emblem of their great secret. I want you to notice that in the Lewis key, you have one piece on the left, one piece on the right. And what connects them all together, stop and think about this. What connects them all together is the centerpiece, the keystone, as it were, that locks everything in place, that fuses the two of opposites together. The symbol of the cross and the crown. You've probably seen this on religious things. The cross is a symbol of the male. The crown is a symbol of the female. The cross is protruding through and fusing with the female. Now, have you ever seen on a Masonic uh, book or design or something like that, here's the symbol of it here, uh, what's called a, a Pythagorean triangle. Okay, Pythagorean, I don't know much about math, so for me to explain this, I kind of get it, but it's kind of hard. It has to do with how to find the third line of an angle, like on a triangle, okay? And the Pythagorean theorem is you take the, the cube of the measurement of line A and the cube of the measurement of line B and you add them together, the sum, and that gives you the cube of the measurement of line C. So you have A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, Masons look for symbols in everything to show you what their secret is. And here's what their secret is. In fact, here's a graphic that illustrates it, okay? The A squared part of the, of the principle is called Osiris, the sun god, okay? The, the god that's up in the sky. The B squared part of it is Isis, the female, the woman who lives on the earth. So you have the sons of God and the daughters of men, A squared plus B squared. What happens when you add A squared to B squared? What happens when you add the sons of God to the daughters of men? What happens? You have a sum. What is that sum? The sum, according to Egyptian lore, was Horus. Horus was the hybrid between the gods and and human women. That's who Horus represented. The Masonic imagery of a ladder connecting the earth with the heavens. Think about what DNA looks like. That ladder is actually connecting heaven and earth together. It's showing the hybrid. Here's a graphic from occultist Eliphas Levi. It shows the fusion of opposites. Notice the two triangles making the hexagram. One pointing up, one pointing down. One showing the heavenly realm, one showing the earthly realm. And they are fused together and they are surrounded. Here, you're going to like this. They're surrounded by a serpent whose tail is in its mouth. Do you know what Albert Pike says about that? You see, you read this stuff and you're going, well, I don't know what that means. When you understand the secret, you get it. Okay, because Albert Pike says, well, the tail represents the male, sons of God. The open mouth of the serpent represents the female, daughters of men. And they're fused together to bring immortality to mankind. That's, that was exactly what Lucifer promised Eve in the Garden of Eden, was if you eat of this fruit, which is the fusion of good and evil together, if you eat of that fruit, then you shall be as gods and ye shall not surely die. That's why all these emblems are emblems of like immortality or resurrection or godhood or the deification of man or man's evolution, where man is headed one of these days. 
Because it represents the fusion where the sons of God are going to mingle themselves in with the seed of men. The image of the Sphinx. We talked about this the last, uh, the last two videos. The image of the Sphinx, guess what it is? It's the fusion of a human and a beast. The number of the beast. 603 score and 6. Man and beast fused together in the same body. I had a pastor that took me to a Masonic temple in McAllister, Oklahoma. And he said, Pastor Mike, you've got to take a look at this. I went and looked at it, took pictures. And now, a temple... A temple, according to the Bible, is a body. And here he showed me this Masonic temple. And I walked on to the front porch of this temple. And on the left-hand side, you have an image of the sun god. You have an image of the male. And it says, let there be light. On the exact opposite side of that porch, on the right-hand side, you have an image of the woman. A female, and it says, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, I want you to, I mean, they're putting it right in front of your face, and if you're not trained in the scriptures, you, you'll go, what does that mean? And they'll say, well, it's a big secret. We can't tell you what it means. Sons of God, daughters of men, light mingled with darkness, and they're fusing together in the same body, in the same temple. That's what that means. It's a hybrid. The Masonic grip. Two guys shaking the hands together. Well, one's coming from this way. One's coming from this way. I can't shake my own hand, by the way. It won't work. Okay? It represents the fusion of two together to come together. See, Masons are all about, listen to this. Masons are all about the brotherhood of all men. That's interesting. Because if men, in order for men to truly become brothers, they must all have the same father. That's what masonry is all about the Masonic hailing sign. Okay, uh, Masons will they, to this day they'll use this. Okay, to signal other Masons. Okay, um, a guy walks up, he does something like this, and if you're a Mason, you know this guy's a Mason. Okay, that's giving you a hailing sign. I want you to look at it. Here, here's what it is. Okay, this is sons of God, daughters of men, light and darkness, the heavenly and the earthly. And they're joined together here in this one body. In the Masonic Lodge, in every Masonic Lodge, they design their lodges where they have a chair on this side and a chair on this side. You have the senior warden and the junior warden. Think about those terms, senior and junior. You know what they are? They're opposites. The junior warden and the senior warden and what joins them together is a chair that's in the middle that belongs to the worshipful master. It's the fusion of them together. In the lodge in Festus, Missouri, actually it's Crystal City. It's like right next door to Festus. Okay, Right next to our top secret broadcasting compound. Uh, the Masonic Lodge there is called the Shekinah Lodge. And some people are going, oh yeah, Shekinah, that's the glory of God. No. No, it's not. I've taught this, I don't know, a bazillion times before, but let me just tell you something. The word Shekinah is not in any Bible. It's not there. It's not in the King James. It's not even the NIV. It's not anywhere. Did you know that the word Shekinah is not even in the Old Testament manuscripts? It's not there. There's a, there's a word related to it that's in its masculine form in the Hebrew text that represents the, the presence of Almighty God. But Shekinah is not the masculine part of that, it's the female form. Okay? The female. You remember that picture of uh, that Michelangelo drew in the Sistine Chapel where God is going to give life to uh, his son, Adam? You remember that picture? Okay, you've seen it before. God giving life to Adam. Zzz, okay? Did you happen to notice that God in that picture had his arm around a red-headed woman with no shirt on? Did you happen to notice that? Okay. You know who that is? It's Shekinah. Okay. I heard a lady uh, on a YouTube video, somebody sent it to me, who had convinced in her mind that the Bible is trying to tell you that the Holy Ghost is a, is a female, that's a, the Holy Ghost is a she, and that when God made Jesus, God the Father and the Holy Ghost got together and made Jesus. That's the same idea of what Shekinah represents, that God 
had a girlfriend, a consort, and they, they mated together, okay, and they produced this little child. That's, that's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, by the way. That concept came up in the Da Vinci Code. Notice the emblem of the Da Vinci Code, the movie. Notice the letter A in Da and the letter V in, in Vinci. Notice that they form opposites, the blade and the chalice, the male and the female, because it was based upon the concept that when Da Vinci uh, painted the Last Supper, Okay, in that chapel, when he painted the Last Supper, you'll notice that here's Jesus, and he's wearing um, a red shirt and a blue cloak, and you have someone sitting next to him wearing a, a blue shirt and a red cloak, and I want you to notice that they're leaning away from one another, and you can see two triangles form there. And that person sitting next to Jesus is not John, not, not John the Divine. It is a woman, Mary Magdalene, Shekinah. Ashtaroth, Ishtar, it's the woman. This right here in the Da Vinci Code is represented the sons of God and the daughters of men together. Da Vinci believed this concept that angels would fuse with humans one of these days because he drew a sketch that he called angel in the flesh. It's interesting. Flesh angel. Angel in a human body. And this angel was featured with male and female parts, all fused in the same body. Remember Baphomet. Here we go. See his, see his arms here? Okay. He represents the fusion of opposites. He is man and beast together, male and female. He is up and down, sun and moon. He is day and night fused together. He is the sun of the morning. That's who he is. This is. So this idea, I mean, it goes in every religion. In um, Marilyn Ferguson's The Aquarian Conspiracy. Oh, here we go. This is the New Age Manual, or Newage, because it rhymes with sewage. This is the Newage Manual, and in this book, I want you to notice this little picture on here, okay? In this book, here's what Marilyn Ferguson says that she uses to describe what the New Age is all about. She says things like, the mysteries we will explore are not remote from us, but ourselves, our brains and bodies, the genetic code. Our own biology is the key. Homo novus, a new human being. Human metamorphosis. The chromosomes are splitting to go forward with a new pattern of life. Everything about the New Age movement is like Freemasonry and everything else. It shows you that there's something else going to happen to mankind. It's going to make him into a god, a new human. Homo novus. Okay, and it centers around this symbol here. It's called the triketra. It is on. Where is it? Where is it? I don't have it up here. I had a I had a copy of the New King James Version of the Bible, and it has that symbol on it. Why? Because it shows the Homo Novus, the new man. What's going to happen when something is added or fused into man's DNA? Uh, the concept of the Great Pyramid on the back of the $1 bill. We talked about this in the other videos. The two lower parts of the pyramid represent man's two-strand DNA. Or, you can look at it again, they represent opposites, male and female. And I want you to notice in the triangle of the pyramid that they are coming together to form what? To form the, the God who was both God and man, the Antichrist, beast and man, fused together in the same body. That's what the Triketra represents, and that's why Ferguson put this on her book. That's what it's all about. You have the idea of transhumanism. A guy by the name of Ray Kurzweil, that Time Magazine did an article on him, and he said by 2045, humans are going to be immortal. We're going to be gods. We're never going to die. We're going to eliminate all sickness and all diseases. Something's going to happen. Mankind's ability to transform himself, we're just almost there. We have to change man's DNA. But he predicted in the next, let's say, 30 years, that mankind would be a different species, a hybrid, something fusing in with it. The image of the yin and the yang. You ever seen that one before? And everybody says, well, it just means that there's a little good and all evil, and there's a little evil and all good. Really? Because the Bible says that God, in whom is no darkness at all, God is good. And in God there is no evil, no darkness, no sin, no unrighteousness, no perversion, nothing. But I want you to notice the emblem of the yin and the yang. It shows the fusion together of opposites, sons of God, 
daughters of men into one symbol now that forms a hybrid. This is, this is what was worshipped in Eastern mysticism. This is what they refer to as balance. This is why when you see... Um, when you see, you've been looking at my tie, haven't you? This is why when you see uh, those who practice Eastern uh, mysticism, when they put their hands together like this, you know what they're doing? They're showing you the opposites fusing together in the same body. Okay? Uh, the concept in, in um, like karate and taekwondo, the idea of balance. You must have balance. You remember the karate kid. You must have balance. Wax on, wax off. Okay? Paint up, paint down. That idea was based upon the mystic oriental concept of the fusion of opposites together to bring balance and harmony. You heard these, oh, we got to have harmony throughout the world. That's what it's all about. It's about fusing the two opposites together. Those principles moving into the church realm. You see things like um, posters that churches put out. Notice the, notice the curvature here. You have the fusion of opposites together. Awakening and impact. Here is a church slogan that refers to themselves as a church of tomorrow. A new connection. Notice the male and the female imagery here joining themselves together. Hybrids and fusion. Where have we heard that from? Okay, Hybrid synergy drive. See the symbol? It's related to the yin-yang, and it shows the fusion of the opposites. Here we have an electric motor, and here we have a gas motor. They don't operate the same. You cannot pour gas into an electric motor. Okay, You can't put electri electricity in the gas tank of a gas motor. But let's, let's make a hybrid. Let's make a new, totally new vehicle that never existed before. Think about it. Okay. Uh, you see this idea of fusion in marketing, Gillette Fusion. You have the symbols there. The, the Ford Fusion, which is a car. V8 Fusion. Hybrid, uh, joining fruits and vegetables together in the same drink. I'd just rather keep them apart. Okay? Um, fusion in the uh, computer realm. This is uh, Compiz Fusion. This is actually a Linux, um, a Linux graphics thing for the Linux operating system. Notice the logo. You see something coming down and something coming up, and they're fusing together. That's what that that's what I, idea is all about. Um, since 9/11, uh, the government decided that we needed to have more integration between the different groups uh, that are spying on everybody in America. They're not really talking to one another, so let's create what these called fusion centers. Okay, the CIA and the NSA and the FBI all fusing together to work together. Um, how about this? Fusion Church. See the symbol? It's about two things being joined together, two opposites being joined together by the hybrid. And then we have the movie that came out about a year and a half ago called Splice, where the scientists actually created an animal-human hybrid. Science fiction. Right? And oh, by the way, and it just always happens this way, the animal-human hybrid in this movie turned out to be a female. She has a baby. Okay? Um, we talked about the Sphinx earlier, the, the fusion of humans and animals together. Here is an article I found uh, just before I came to record this. The article says, forget Darwin. DNA science could soon let humans play God. The article says the new human species is, the, is one that begins to engineer the evolution of viruses, plants, animals, and itself. As we do that, Darwin's rules get significantly bent and sometimes even broken. Eventually, we get to the point where evolution is guided by what we're engineering. That's a big deal. In other words, we're at, a, we're at a place right now with technology and everybody who works in either, in, um, either in chemistry, biology, or advanced technology knows this. We're at a point now where we can see that we are almost to a point where we're ready to start drastically and significantly altering the human body so that we become a different species entirely. And that's going to be done by 
joining like technology in with humans or, as we mentioned earlier, animal DNA in with human DNA or humans in with animals, one or the other. And think about it. You think this is far-fetched. There are laws. There are laws in the United States of America that govern the use of scientists mixing human and animal DNA together. The government doesn't, doesn't think it's far-fetched. The scientists don't think it's far-fetched. And we're living in a world right now where the reality of the scriptures is going to come to pass. Remember, we're to look back to see what the future holds. And I remember there's one character out of mythology that just really just grabs my attention. I want to go back to this, this image of, um, of Baphomet. Okay, I want you to look at that image of Baphomet. Okay? Um, he is a hybrid. He is opposites together, up and down, male and female, uh, angel and human. Notice the wings, angel and human. And he's a hybrid of man and beast. Okay? You know what that, you know what that creature was? It was called a satyr. Now I may, may, may be pronouncing that wrong. Satire, satyr. A satyr was half human, half beast. You remember Dagon? Okay, the god of the giants was half human, half fish. Okay, a hybrid. The satyrs were half human, half beast. Now, I would just say, you know what, that's just, I'm not even going to pay attention to that. Had it not been for the use of the word satyrs in the King James Bible, remember, satyrs represent hybrid humans. Notice what it says in Isaiah 13. Now remember, Isaiah 13 is a prophecy against Babylon. And what is Babylon? Babylon is the kingdom of mingled people. Okay? It's the mingled people that God says, hey, come away from them. Don't get into marriages with them. Don't do anything. Do not mix the holy seed with those people. Don't do it. This is a prophecy against the kingdom of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 13. Look at what it says. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, and the beauty of the Chaldees' excellencies shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall, shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Satyrs are going to... It's just what the Bible says. It says it again in Isaiah chapter 34. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl shall also rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall be the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Now I'm going to stop right here. Because as a form of judgment, God fills the land. Instead of being full of animals, instead of being full of humans, it's now full of beasts and hybrids. That's, that's what God said. Now, God has a different way than this. I want you to notice in verse 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. From my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. I want, you to, I want to show you this. Here is the Old Testament. Here is the New Testament. Did you know that if you read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament, you know what you'll see? You'll see that they are connected together. This is the book of the Lord that you're to seek out. None shall want her mate. You want an understanding of the New Testament? You want an understanding of the book of Revelation? Go back to the book of Genesis. That's her mate. They all connect together and unite together to give wisdom to someone who really wants wisdom, someone who really wants to know. And I think you want to know what's going to happen in the future. And I'm telling you, according to the scriptures, there is going to be a hybridization of mankind. And you know what that will cause? That will have the effect of negating God's offer of salvation to all mankind because God doesn't save beasts. God saves humans. And so his offer of salvation extends for as long as you are human. But mark my word, 
This is what is going to happen. Albert Pike says it's going to happen. Marilyn Ferguson said it was going to happen. Joseph Smith even got it when he said, hey, the real religion is in, in the sacred marriage, uniting male and female so they'll become gods. And Joseph Smith got it. Okay. Dan Brown, let's pull out all my books here. Dan Brown, The Lost Symbol, that's what it was all about. It was about man becoming God by the hybridization and that secret being kept in Freemasonry. And God has a different way. Okay? See, man's way is let's take corrupt man and make his corrupt body live forever. I don't want that. God has a different way. He says, let's take corrupt man, kill the corrupt body, and I'll raise up a new body out of that that will live forever. That's the one I'm going for. This is Pastor Mike. Lots of information here. I know that I've given you a lot. Go back and study these things and be a Berean to see whether or not they be true. And I appreciate you watching. God bless you. Bye-bye.